In this video, I'm going to be going through the 2019 preliminary HSC or Year 11 Engineering Studies end of year exam or the preliminary examination. Uh, this was 60 marks, which is um, 65 marks, which is typical for a two hour exam. Um, there are plenty of students who do finish this in less time, so keep that in mind. Um, Okay, so I'm just going to go through these really quickly. I'm only going to go for the answers. It's possible I'm going to get things wrong because even though I wrote this test, um, sometimes I just I read things quickly and I make mistakes. So, um, concrete is made of cement and aggregates, D, uh, which results in elongated grains, work hardening. Identify the product most likely to be forged, uh, spanners. Which is most correct? Um, AC is more efficient than DC. It's only most correct. It's not entirely correct. Um, but nobody cares about, you know, technically correct is the best kind of correct. Um, AC is mostly the, is the most correct. Uh, and you notice that yeah, I even wrote that in here. Brass is an example of which of the following. Brass is a substitutional alloy. That's relatively tough. Okay, the properties of some stainless steels can be altered using the following procedure. That is precipitation hardening. Uh, there's a video, it's one of my earliest videos. Which is the typical crystal structure of titanium? Oh, that's a hard question, but I did definitely make it true for homework, which was um, hexagonal close packed. That's a hard question. Um, you'll notice this is in red because I had the, a duplicate question and that was a reminder for me to change it when I next use this. Uh, you know, so often I modify questions when I do new things. Um, what is the forming process used in the diagram below? That is rolling. Um, in year 12, you'll be expected to tell the difference between hot and cold rolling, but for the moment, rolling is the answer. Um, which of the following is a third order leaf? I don't like this question, even though I've used this in both the 2018 and 2019 question. Uh, just because it's more recall than applied knowledge. Um, but the third order lever is where the effort is closer to the fulcrum. This is a second order lever where the load, the load of number two is near the wheel of the wheelbarrow. Uh, seesaws are first order levers. Seesaws can be, or first order levers can have a mechanical advantage above or below one. Um, second order levers always have a mechanical advantage greater than one. The third order levers always are less than one. And that's a much better question because that's an applied knowledge thing. Which of the statement best describes tungsten um, inert gas or TIG welding? So we have um, the arc melts the filler rod, which is surrounded in inert gas. Uh, the other ones all refer to different kinds of things. You should be able to figure that out if you look at my notes. Um, which is the term that describes the flow of electric charge? That's current. Uh, which is the best indicator of the toughness of material in a stress strain diagram? The area under the curve, uh, total area under the curve. Why are gears of small devices powder formed? That is because it reduces uh, machining. Um, what is the stress of force divided by 10 mil diameter of 10 millimeters? Okay, so 10 um, millimeter diameter is 25 pi. Loud noise, I'm sorry for anyone who's listening to that in headphones. Um, I did not intend to do that, but yeah, I don't care enough that I'm going to edit it out. So it's uh, 12,000 divided by five squared is 25, right, 25 pi. Um, that is, oh, I'm not sure I see the answer I like. Okay, I'm gonna do that properly. Um, 10 squared, times pi divided by four equals, yes, yeah, 78, that looks about right. And then 12,000 divided by 78 equals 152.7, that's C. Okay, so this is where, I mean, in this case, I didn't use estimation. In this case, multiple choice said, hey, the answer's not here. Maybe you want to take another crack at that. Um, a box has a mass of 80 kilograms. What is the force applied that required to push it across the surface? Okay, so unless stated otherwise, we always assume that the um, it's on a horizontal surface, and that in that case the new um, the normal or the, the perpendicular force will be equal to the mass. Uh, sorry, equal to the weight, which is mass times gravity. We're going to use gravity of um, 10, so we're going to say 
f equals mu n, mu is 0.4 times 800 equals 320, that's d. Okay, the circuit shows the inputs, what's required to get, um, which one gives an output of 1? x, y, and z. Okay, so for this to be 1, both of the AND gates need to be 1. So x and y both need to be 1. So x and y, d is the only option. So, yeah. Okay, question on CAD. I love these questions on CAD. Um, what are the reasons why we use CAD software? It's cheaper, easy to render, provide dimensions, uses Australian standards, accuracy. C looks good. Accuracy, editing, storage, um, integration with other software. I've talked about this in videos recently. Um, I'm not going to, I don't feel any great need to go through it in detail now. Um, which of the following is most correct? Cast iron is incorrect. Uh, machine ability, that's correct. B is the right one. answer. Ca uh, let me have a look. Cast iron is between one and two. No, that's steel. Cast iron, oh, that says cart iron, um, is more ductile than steel. That is incorrect. So B is the correct answer. Okay, um, now as a shorthand, uh, we've looked at some of these. There's a Facebook um, post or album that has a collection of these questions. Whenever you see two resistors in parallel that have the same resistance, you can just halve them. If you have three, you can just divide them by three. But we'll go through it properly. Um, in the formula sheet, it would say one over RT equals one over R1 plus one over R2. Am I gonna show you that? Do I care enough? Probably not. Um, no, I've decided I don't care enough. Um, so what we got is one over 100 plus one over 100 is two over 100, right? Um, if we flip that, we get 100 over two. 100 over two is 50. 50 plus 100 equals 150 D. Okay, moving along. Um, what is an ethical consideration relating to biomedical um, engineering? The go-to answer is animal testing, though a lot of people talk about cochlear implants. It says outline, um, you can talk about, well, you know, sentient creatures feel pain, um, you know, there are a lot of people opposed to that. Um, though at the same time, if we don't test on animals, we have to test on humans, humans are probably capable of feeling, experiencing greater pain, that would be the, that's the sort of direction you're going with. There's lots of other ones. Um, the cochlear implant is often uh, uh, the one that I see probably most commonly. Explain why designing engineering projects to imp uh, minimize environmental impact. Okay, so the idea here is we want to reduce, reuse, recycle. Reducing the design, um, reducing the materials in the design process is the more is more efficient because um, recycling still produces a fair amount or requires electricity. Re electricity reduces uses non renewable resources that produce carbon dioxide. Um, that's a bad thing. Also, recycling generally is never going to... Uh, uh, the recycling metal is pretty good. Recycling um, asphalt is pretty good. But um, recy recycling plastic, not ideal. Also, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't ever make it to the recycling plant. Only 10% of re um, plastic has ever been recycled. Um, but then there's downcycling. That's plenty for three marks. Uh, Evaluate the impacts of break by wire systems. So describe and evaluate. So break by wire is when we use, um, we instead of using pneumatic or um, hydraulic brake systems or mechanical brake systems, instead we use a um, computer circuitry so that when you press the brake pedal, it activates um, a control system that you sends an electrical signal to servos and actuators to apply the brakes. This is more reliable because it's less, less prone to failure, especially that you can have re multiple redundancies. Um, it has lower weight, which doesn't really matter for brakes, but it matters a lot when we talk about fly-by-wire next year in year 12. Um, and what is the other aspect that we can... Um, it's more effective. Like we can apply a much greater force than we could with um, say hydraulic brake systems. Okay, sketch and label microstructure of 0.83% um, carbon steel. So you divide up into a couple of sections and then you draw a parallel lines in different directions for each grain to represent 100% perlite. You need to label it. If you don't write a draw an arrow and says perlite, then you don't get a mark. Um, ooh. 
Okay, so the diagram I can see here, that's a hypo-eutectoid. So it's, it's got too much carbon in it. That X that you can see there, that means that's a mentite. No, that only happens when you're greater than 0.83%. Um, at 0.83, it should be all perlite. Yep. Um, okay. So if you're not sure about that, look at my, I have my, one of my oldest videos on ferrous metals. I think you were looking at steels, um, and steel alloys maybe. Um, it will have, yeah, it'll do. Um, it will have all of those sorts of microstructures, so in the textbook as well. Uh, gears of a vehicle have been hardened and tempered. Uh, describe the resulting grain structure resulting in a label diagram. Oh, okay, so when you draw a martensite, you just draw a whole bunch of sticks, um, a secular martensite. If you look at the picture of Cora, you can actually see what a photograph looks like, but as far as I'm concerned, if you just draw a whole bunch of lines, you know, if you, imagine if you were drawing, say, an echidna or a porcupine or a hedgehog, one of those sorts of things. Um, I mean, it's not right. If you look at the picture of Cora in the background, you can actually see a photograph of a secular martin site, or you can look at, um, I've had some practice exams which are on heat treatment on um, Google Classroom, and you, you can fill out the worksheet on ferrous metals. Um, anyway, let's describe the process. What you need to do is you need to heat to 100% austenite, which you could write that a couple of ways. You could say heat to red hot, heat to 100% heat to gamma steel. Um, there are different ways. Austenite, you have to spell it. It's 10 out of 10 on austenite. It's got T-E-N because austenite, he's a 10 out of 10 in the looks department. Um, heat to red hot because austenite, he's so hot. Um, doesn't exist at room temperature. Anyway, once you heat to 100% austenite, you then cool rapidly by quenching in oil. This produces uh, martensite. In, to temper, you then heat again to a lower temperature, and this is redu this reduces the stress in the martensite crystals. When we draw tempered martensite, it still looks pretty much the same. Um, remember, make sure that again you have to label it. So that means just drawing an arrow that says martensite. You could, if you wanted to, you could write needle-like or acicular martensite, even better. Um, I don't think anyone's ever going to take a mark off and not writing that. It's a shame that I don't have answers here, but um, yeah, I'm not, we're not using a whiteboard, so we're just trying to go through this quickly. Describe the process of lost wax um, or investment casting. It's four stages. I give half mark for each. First step is make the thing out of wax. Second step is coat the wax in ceramic. Third thing is you melt the wax and pour it out. The fourth thing is you pour the molten metal into the ceramic. The, once it cools, you then shake off uh, or remove the ceramic, uh, leaving the finished product. There's four steps, uh, half mark each. We don't give half marks, but um, yeah, a reasonable attempt will give one. Uh, explain how brakes cause a vehicle to stop. Kinetic energy is transformed to heat using friction. That's what I'm looking for. That is... Um, that is really a lot of marks for fairly that I made that three marks that's pretty generous um, you could maybe talk about for three marks I would even consider talking about regenerative brakes in the case of regenerative brakes they convert it to electricity um, also I would maybe say that when you play, apply the brakes an incompressible brake fluid transfers the force um, to apply a piston that puts the disc in contact, uh, sorry, the brake pad in contact with the disc. Now that's me reading into a lot, it, reading into that question a lot. So if I said, explain how um, disc brakes using a hydraulic brake lining cause a vehicle to slow and stop, then that would probably be a much better question for three marks. That's a, that's a, I, I like that question a lot more because now I want you to talk about the hydraulic brakes. I want you to talk, you talk about the discs and the piston and um, the caliper put, forcing the brake pad into contact with the rotor um, and the transformation of energy. That's, an, that's a solid three mark question. Okay, uh, describe the components. Okay, so why is a forged stem? This is a pretty common question in year 11 preliminary exams. Uh, the idea is that um, you can look on in the Copeland book. It shouldn't take you too much effort to find a picture of what this looks like. Um, 
the idea is that when it's machined, you're just drawing parallel lines more or less in the direction of this in this uh, hip stem. With forged, you're showing the lines actually going around the object. The advantage of this is that there's much less weakness. There's much less likely to shear um, at these small points of um, smaller diameter. Whereas here, these are far more likely to break off. Um, having something break off inside your body is very, very bad. Um, yeah, that would probably do. Uh, what I would write as an answer is that the machine section, the grain flow is um, parallel, which means that there's points of weakness. In the forge section, the grain flows around the object, reducing the likelihood of small sections shearing. Okay, identify two engineering ceramics and identify their application. Hmm, it's a good question, if I do say so myself. Uh, bricks. Um, Identified two engineering ceramics. And so, okay, well, I, said, I was just about to get, pat myself on the back and help with the questions. It really should say, um, it, it shouldn't say property. It should say like use. Anyway, w w making the most of the situation. So if I said bricks, um, the application is that they're used in walls. They can be load bearing, but typically they're used just to divide spaces. Um, bricks can be fire rated to prevent, uh, look, that's more, more marks than we need. The second one is concrete. Uh, concrete's a bit of a, it is a ceramic, it's a composite material though. So let's go with something else, let's go with glass. Glass is used to allow light into buildings and to, for people to be able to see outside. Uh, they're they're, they're um, making the most of their transparent properties. Um, you could also talk about, say, like they're using cars to stop um, the wind from, you know, from negatively impacting the driver, um, but still allowing good visibility, something like that. Um, okay. I mean, obviously, you could talk about semiconductors. That's pretty pretty brave. I probably wouldn't talk about semiconductors because you never know. The market might not might not agree that that's a ceramic, even though generally we consider it a ceramic. Uh, you could talk about spark plugs and other insulators. You could talk about abrasive materials, anything from sandpaper to um, diamond saws. You could also talk about... I d did say I probably wouldn't write down concrete because that's a composite material, but you, I would give that as correct. Um, you could talk about like stone, that you know people use marble bench tops. Again, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go there. Okay, um, a copper wire is six hundred millimeters in length. It has a cross-sectional area of 0.5 millimeters. Young's modulus for copper is one 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 gigapascals. Calculate the extension of the wire if it has a tensile load of three hundred millimeter, three hundred newtons. Okay, so the formula is E equals flea. If you don't know what I mean, um, I have videos on this, um, but and I think it's actually listed as E equals flea is like usually the name of the the video. But the idea is that the Young's modulus of elasticity, capital E, is represented as stress over strain. Stress is force over area divided by um, strain, which is extension over length. When you um, divide two fractions, what you end up doing is you multiply them and invert them. So what you get is capital F times capital L divided by lowercase e times capital A. And obviously that the bottom half you have to put in brackets if you're typing into say Excel. What that means is that you can actually rearrange the two E's so that you can swap the little E and the big E. So that you can say that extension is equal to brackets um, force times length divided by brackets Young's modulus times area. So that's what we're going to do. Now you have to convert your units. I like to use grease units. We go together like megapascals and millimetres squared. So we need to have everything be in millimetres and megapascals. Um, we have gigapascals, so a gigapascal is a thousand megapascals. So we've got force, force is in newtons, that's great, good, we always use newtons, times force times 600 millimeters, yep, that's okay, we're happy with millimeters, divided by brackets, um, E, which is, calculate the extension, okay, so we're, we're using capital E, which is 111 times a thousand times 0.5, close brackets, gives me an answer of 32, you get that? 32 millimeters. 
Uh, for the same conditions, calculate the strain in the wire. Oh, okay. So interesting that I've done that, that I've asked you to calculate the extension and then the strain. Uh, the thing is, if you just wrote down anything here, I would say that that was the extension. And then once you know the extension, I would then um, have, a, if you got it wrong, I would do a carried error. So what you're doing is 32 is the extension divided by the original length, which is 600, which gives us a strain of 0.054. Yep. Um, yeah, you divided by the area. You divided by 0.5, which is the area. That's wrong. Yeah. So, you, so you've done strain equals force over area. That's wrong. Stress equals force over area. Strain, which is a different symbol, which is epsilon, equals extension over length. Also written in uh, uni, you'll write it as delta L divided by L0. Um, we use strain is equal to E over... So uh, I'll go to the formula sheet. There is a formula sheet at the end. Um, so Young's modulus equals stress over strain. Strain is equal to extension over length, right? So it's epsilon equals, so at uni you'll write delta L over L zero. Um, and I do find that that is actually helpful to think of it that way. The problem is if you use those letters, you don't get E equals flea. All good? Okay. Um, and we're back. Okay, Pascal's principle. So they've given us the areas, right? It's really important that because they've given us the areas, um, I have a tendency to always think in diameters. If it's diameters, you need to take the diameter ratio and then square it to get the area ratio. They've already given us the area ratio. The area ratio is um, Y is five times bigger than X. So that means that the force at Y is gonna be five times bigger than the force at X. If they told us that it's 800 Newtons being applied at X, we're gonna get five times as much so 800 times five is 4,000, yep, yeah, boom. Okay, um, now this question, a fully efficient lever pivoting at A has a force of 40 newtons at 45 degrees, calculate the force to maintain equilibrium. Okay, there's a couple of ways that you can do this. The I always like perpendicular distance, but almost nobody does that. What they do instead is they break this force into two components. So they say 40, um, and then they do 40 times sine 30, or I just write, I know what, sorry, sine 45. I know what sine 45 is, that's 707, so I just multiply that. So what we get is 28 um, newtons going down and 28 newtons going to the, 48 newtons going down and 48 newtons going to the left. What that means is that the one going to the left we can ignore because it's in line with A. So there's no perpendicular distance. So what we're going to get is 28.8, sorry, 28.28 multiplied by 1.3 meters gives us times 28.28 equals 36.8 kilonewton meters of force, right? Uh, of, of, of turning moment, right? kilonewton meters of turning moment. If we have that many kilonewton meters of turning moment going anti-clockwise, well, we're gonna to need to have some amount of force going clockwise, a, a moment force going clockwise to balance that. If we know that it's 36 kilonewtons um, of turning force or turning moment, then in that case, if it's 36 kilonewton meters and we divide by 0.6 meters, we're gonna have 61 um, newton, kilonewtons of force is required to maintain equilibrium. Okay, um, another less efficient lever is shown below. Calculate the efficiency of the system. Okay, so I like this question, it's a good question. Um, so this is a third order lever, which means that we are going to have a mechanical advantage of less than, uh, okay, so in this example, it's worth saying that whenever we have something like mechanical advantage or velocity ratios or anything like that, if they don't say, we just assume 100%. Right, and so here we said it's a fully efficient lever, right? It's 100% efficient. Here, what they're doing is they're um, asking for um, efficiency. Efficiency is equal to mechanical advantage over velocity ratio. So what we'll start with is what's the mechanical advantage? So what they're saying is that 40 newtons of effort is required to lift 10 newtons. That means that's a bad mechanical advantage, right? So that's um, a mechanical advantage of one divided by four or 0 0.25, right? So we have to put in more effort than we're actually getting out, where our effort is 40 kilonewtons. Now, what is our velocity ratio? Well, we always have to measure from the force to the pivot. So we're gonna get a 600 divided by 1300. 
gives us um, 0 0.46. Now, if we take Is that... that sorry, thank you. Excellent. That would have been embarrassing. No one wants to be wrong on the internet. 6 divided by 19... 600 divided by 1900 because we measure 19, 13, 13 plus 600 um, equals 1900. So thank you. That would have been embarrassing. And yeah, okay. Anyway, um, so if we said that a mechanical advantage was 0.25, if we take 0.25 divided by 0.31, we're going to get an efficiency of 79.16%. Uh, if you wrote 80%, I'd give that as correct. Um, so just to go through the formula sheet, I'll just quickly show you. So mechanical advantage is written here. Mechanical advantage equals load over effort. Velocity ratio is the distance traveled by the effort divided by the distance traveled by the load. Efficiency is equal to mechanical advantage divided by velocity ratio. Um, yeah, so that gives us the efficiency of the system is 80% efficient. Uh, for these drawings, I'm not going to go through these drawings, and the reason for that is because we have done these in class. So I've already had an opportunity to talk to people in class, and working um, you know, via the computer, it's, it's not ideal. Already I've had to go through microstructures. Hopefully that will give you some guidance, and uh, that will be able to help you um, in your study.